Hello, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of The County Seat. I'm your host, Chad Booth. We want to talk about grazing. You know, the old adage always is, how are we going to continue to feed the population as the population grows? Well, the answer is we become more efficient at the way we do things. Grazing plays a big part of that, and today on the county seat, we're going to look at that issue. We're going to talk about new techniques that improve grazing, improve the habitat, maintain the land better, and provides more yield. We will be taking a tour of Rich County to look at this issue. In fact, we are now going to join Terry Wood to find out why the grass in Rich County is always greener. In farming, it's well known that after a couple of years of growing on a patch of land, you let that ground lie fallow for a season so that it can rest and regain the nutrients it needs to continue producing your crop. This is called crop rotation. Surprisingly enough, this same principle is being used by cattle ranchers. In this case, it's called time-controlled grazing or rotational grazing, and it's helping livestock owners preserve the land for future generations. Time-controlled grazing is different from your typical foraging where cattle or other livestock are dropped off at a pasture for the season. The control system requires more available pastures and is designed to give the plants time to rest and recuperate. The number of days in any given pasture is kept to a minimum, while pasture recovery time is maximized. The time of year that a pasture is used is also planned out in advance, with the idea being that grazing can actually help plants. Most arid lands evolved with, with groups of herbivores periodically um, feeding heavily on the landscape and then moving on. I think the land is used to that. So what we try to do with our, with our livestock is make their function on the landscape be like that. In other words, they come through, they graze a pasture, they take the vegetation off, but they don't graze it to the point where they really hurt plants. We spend a particular attention to the length of time that we graze a pasture. We also think a lot about the time of year that we graze pastures. We try to mix the time of year up. Here's an example of how it works. Let's take a pasture and watch it for a period of four years. Each visit to the pasture will typically be seven to 10 days for the cattle. One year, it would be grazed in May or June. The next year, it would be grazed in July or August. The third year, it would be grazed in September or October. And the fourth year, it wouldn't be grazed at all. Over that four year period, that pasture will have only been grazed for 30 or 35 days, and the rest of that time, those plants will be recovering from the grazing. The first thing that we saw change in the, in the mid 80s was that the riparian areas, the streams and the meadows that have good moisture year long, healed up drastically. When you compare that to areas that are season long grazed as opposed to rotationally grazed, Quite often the riparian areas are the, the areas that look the hardest hit. Essentially what we're seeing is less bare ground and more live living plants on the landscape. From an enterprise perspective, we've been able to run significantly more cattle. We probably run about a third more cattle now than what we did before. We've also seen increases in the wildlife populations as well. We don't often equate wildlife with a ranching operation. But another benefit of time-controlled grazing is that the abundant, nutritious green plants attract elk, mule deer, pronghorn, sage grouse, and over 260 different bird species. The exciting part was trying to dovetail that with agriculture, you know, to try to take the idea that they don't have to be mutually exclusive. You, know, you can run livestock and you can also have wildlife, you know, healthy wildlife populations. Less bare ground means more plants, which means more food and nutrition. It seems that, that with this alternating between grazing and inappropriate rest, it's the two of them together. It's not one or the other, it's both. It's alternating between the two. We've had a lot of independent people look at the wildlife populations here. We've had independent people look at our livestock and look at our landscape. And I'm, I absolutely believe you know, based on independent information, that this is a much better way of managing these western landscapes than season-long grazing. There's an opportunity to, to do some things different. You know, there's, there's certainly challenges in that there's some additional investment in terms of wild, uh, water and fence and some additional management that, 
that is somewhat limiting to some people, some operations, but you know, we felt like they've been profitable investments here. The forage may be greener on the other side of the fence, but it may not be time to move cattle there unless that forage has been properly rested. For the county seat, I'm Terry Wood. Thank you, Terry, for that report. Now we have a good basic understanding of what is going on in grazing. We will be talking about rotational grazing and its impacts on communities and on agriculture in general when we return here on the county seat. Stay with us. Have you ever wanted to go on a vacation to Mars? What about a visit to the Old West? Impossible, right? Well, forget what you think is real. In southern Utah's Kane County, other worlds are just an ATV ride away. The Old West lives on in every sunset. From the downtown streets of Little Hollywood to the vistas that have inspired the world. Never find yourself closer to home and yet farther than you've ever been. Southern Utah's Kane County, where anywhere is possible. The State of Utah School and Institutional Trust Lands Administration. CITLA manages 3.5 million acres of Utah lands with the express purpose of furthering the education of Utah students while promoting local industry, oil and gas, even residential development, all at the same time. Through the careful use of trust lands, we distributed more than $22 million to Utah schools last year. The State of Utah School and Institutional Trust Lands Administration, building the state's permanent school fund. 